All right, guys, welcome. A bug in the system, episode two of the current Living World season four just went live. So that means a huge number of changes to the game and additions. First of all, most importantly, maybe to a lot of you, when you log in, you'll notice a new region of the world has just opened up for exploration. It's just south of Dajka. So this video is going to be spoiler free. Don't worry about that. I'm not going to talk about the story here. But uh, the region itself is an island that seems to have appeared sort of north of Istan, which already titillates me, uh, thinking back to early speculation there could be an island up there and related to Utopia. This patch represents the first first time we get to go to an entirely new area of the franchise in ages, like ages and ages. If you think about the expansion we just went to, mostly it's retreading old places. If you think of a lot of the Living World Season 3 places, it was similar. Here we're going to pretty much uncharted territory in either game, so it's a really thrilling idea of a place to return to. Uh, of course, there's all the story associated with it. There'll be uh, a ton of content I expect up in that map too. If you remember episode one, it wasn't just a standard map, but it also had races there. It had the new bounty system there. It had a proper meta there, which season three maps were lacking. Uh, we had two full new weapon sets. All of that should be bundled in with that island. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting in and talking more about that later. This video won't necessarily be on all those new chunky additions. We're just going to talk about the quality of life and regular changes that have come into the game as a result of the patch, which still has some pretty meaty stuff. So let's jump in. Uh, first of all, it says, a scientist in the mysterious inquest facility known as Rata Primus appears to hold the key to stopping Joko's vengeful invasion of Tyria, but infiltrating the enemy's stronghold will prove challenging. Even with old friends and new allies lending their talents to the mission, the secret of Rata Primus threatens to engulf Ilona in deadly chaos. So that's the description of the new stuff. And then we jump straight in. So there's a new legendary, as we know, with these patches. We've got the Claw of the Khan Ur. This, uh, as we know from the teaser trailer last week, uh, maybe you saw my video on, is a dagger. Uh, we speculated it was going to be the Claw of the Khan Ur. It actually is. They say here that a new legendary weapon's available. Speak to Hobbs to be able to craft it. Um, if you guys have been saving up your resources, you can get it already. If you look at the footage in the background, uh, one of my guildies got it the second the patch went out. And so this is some of the earliest footage you'll see of this legendary. It looks really cool. Uh, the unsheath effect has like uh, the shadow almost of a fiery domineering looking char. Many char allies around it as well. It's got uh, char style like golden shining footprints. The projectile animation is looks really badass actually. Uh, like you're throwing the dagger in sort of this magical wave. Um, and then lastly it's kind of got an aura. I don't really like the aura too much. It looks really like fluffy and misty and just sort of very in your face. This is the kind of aura I don't like. Uh, I prefer stuff like Coda's Warmth. Um, but hey, uh, that's the new legendary and it should pair well with a lot of cool gear The person who's demonstrating this to you actually in the footage has tons of the new legendaries has the new sword from episode 6 Has the uh, new world versus world legendary back piece from just around episode 6 has full legendary armor So you can see someone as a 2k 18 fully contemporary kitted out Guild Wars 2 Fashion Wars uh, Kind of character there. So there you have that uh, moving on they move into a world polish section as always There's interesting things to pick out here first of all crystal away Oasis, they fixed some undersea worms that were floating instead of being anchored to the seabed. I guess that would have been reported because the water's around there. That's right where the most recent expansion starts, so lots of people will be going there all the time, submitting bug reports. Does it really matter for the game? Let's be real, probably not. Uh, over in Gendarren Fields, a core 2012 area, they fixed a bug in which one of the events involving some children that explore there disappeared for a long period of time. I wasn't aware that was a thing, but there you have it. The Desert Highlands in a Path of Fire, they fixed a bug where people could get blocked if they were doing a certain achievement, not too interesting. Domain of Abbey, this one's a bit cooler, they increased the visibility of the funeral procession event at the Necropolis and the event itself will restart after a few minutes if it gets failed. If you succeed, then it starts a chain of events that is eventually cycled back to the funeral procession. So I'm not too familiar with exactly what happens there, I think this is where they go through all those rituals and maybe it ends up at that court area. Um, but the idea from this patch note, it almost sounds like they might have added new events to the game to cycle it around. And that's cool because uh, some of those places in Valley are really exciting and I've just not explored enough. Uh, they have a change in Dredge Haunt Cliffs 2012 area where they remove an invisible wall on one of the platforms. This is rectifying a mistake they will have made a while back uh, when they added mounts to Corteria. They put invisible walls in tons of places to stop you breaking out and seeing truly horrendous map geometry that the original developers never expected you to see. But they were pretty um, 
quick and easy about where they put those invisible walls. Let's put it this way. And sometimes they blocked off important stuff. And one of them was a Dostoev uh, Sky Peak. And I've gifted, they've just refined that out. Could have something to do with a guild trek, maybe, or one of those sort of weirder pieces of content most people don't think about. And their testers obviously didn't think about. Moving on, there's some other small bits of polish which you can pause. I won't go through all of them. Of particular interest to me is the Iron Marches one, where they fix a stall for Necromancer Bria, a stall I've run into many times and I'm really happy to see. You'll see a chunk of patch notes dedicated to Heart of Thorns adventures. So if you're one of these new players that's just got the most recent expansion and now you're exploring Heart of Thorns again, you might have been frustrated by the style of content this is, where they ask you to play it a lot to get good, to get your rewards, and they've nerfed that down to make it easy. I've already delivered my thoughts on that earlier in the week, so we won't go over that again, but the change has indeed gone through on those. And finally, fixed a bug that caused the footstep effect of legendary greatswords to render at only half the intended rate if you're a male Silvari. I'm sure someone out there thinks that this is the greatest change that's ever gone into the game. It's not me, but there you go, it's probably important uh, to the Fashion Wars fans out there. Moving on, really cool patch now, uh, let's get into general changes, health bars. So, uh, as you guys know, if you play a support in this game, because of some wonky, shaky, ill-defined ideas about balance and what support's role should be in Guild Wars 2 for the formative years of this MMO, a lot of stuff sort of hasn't been in place if you play someone who does a lot of healing. But that is much more of a thing in Guild Wars 2 ever since Heart of Thorns in many different formats of the game. It's always been a bit frustrating that as a support character, it can be really difficult to see that tiny little health bar above your ally's head visually and to have to then look up at the party window and then translate which character name means which character near you to be able to drop your ground target heal or whatever. It's just fiddly because there's no such thing in Guild Wars 2 as clicking a party window person and just directly casting on them. So uh, it's really important that there's visible, good, decent health bars on your allies. And the devs have shown numerous different uh, implementations and things for this over the years. Sometimes better ones have been in and they've been inexplicably removed. This patch standardizes the whole thing and gives us some options for it. So check this out. New health bar controls have been added to general options under the user interface section. These controls are designed to improve the experience of healer and support roles by optionally so you don't have to clutter your screen up if you're not playing these roles, if you don't want to, by optionally increasing the visibility of ally health. So they've got four options for us. One is thick party health bars, which will show large health bars for anyone in your party, in PvP, and for your squad subgroup members. So if you're in a 50-man squad, the only people with the big health bars will be the ones that are in your specific subgroup. Then there's just thick squad health bars, which shows the larger health bars for all squad members. Then there's always show them, so no matter where you are, you'll always get the big health bars. This will clutter your screen a lot. Um, and then finally, always show squad health bars. So you kind of get to pick which ones you go for. Uh, hopefully I have some footage for you guys of it. As of recording this bit of the video, I haven't seen what it looks like. But I'm hoping the devs do well and um, this will be nice. I actually love playing support in PvE. Uh, playing a Tempest support is one of the main things I do in Fractals. And now being able to much easier see when someone's low to walk over and pop my heel on them is going to be fantastic. So really looking forward to that. Okay, just editing in here. I've played it now. It's so good. Oh, I'm actually really excited about this in Conquest as well. Hopefully, there'll be a lot less situations where my allies don't realize if I'm really low on health and they won't go for a res or whatever. This is so cool. People should be so much more aware. It looks like a much more traditional MMO-y kind of game just to look at gameplay and footage now, doesn't it? But in terms of usability, how good is this? You can combo the thick bars with, like, turning off everyone else's names to clear up the clutter a bit. It's good. I'm in a 50 man squad in this footage. Next, they've got a change for looking for group. Most people on the internet right now, uh, in reception to this patch, as I make the video, are loving this change. I personally don't think it's that big of a deal, but I don't use LFG much. So we'll see how much uh, you guys think of this down in the comments. The search results filter for looking for group has been improved to support exclusion filters, and it now has improved support for multi-word filters. So, what does this mean? Well, they give us an example. Players can filter out sellers, and they can require the phrase, say, level 80, in the results by using the following filters, dash WTS, dash sell, and uh, level 80. So, I believe that this filtering system is essentially how you treat, like, filters on Google, I think, um, and in many other standardized locations. So, this is cool. If you are a significant raider that spends a lot of time, but you don't have a guild, and you spend a lot of time in the aerodrome, being at, you'll now be able to type dash sell, 
and you'll be able to filter out all these people who are just from like guilds that are trying to sell clears instead of actually play the game uh, and that's good I think that that's very nice it could affect other things but really selling is mostly going to be this concept of runners in Guild Wars because everything's moved over to the trading post for other matters of economy so there you have it uh, moving on we've got fractals uh, so there were some dev posts about this. Uh, I hadn't shared with you guys just yet um, I think way back actually when they first just decided on it I did mention it in a video, but it really uh, came forward a lot lately. So uh, random mislock instabilities Just as a reminder after you beat the tier 1 fractals as in you go through them all at least once They start putting different effects gambits on you that change up your experience but the thing is before this patch those effects were always static. It was like you'd always have the same instabilities, the same gambits on you at uh, the 37 fractal every day all the time. And so it was kind of an interesting system, but it never went far enough to randomize and keep uh, fractals feeling spicy day in, day out. Because you'd always know if it was a 99 that you're always going to get the same things. Well, now they've uh, updated it. So they now randomize each week. So every week you go into fractals. And don't forget, you can do fractals daily, so you can experience it seven times, and then it will change uh, to something else. The devs offered further clarification on this on the forums, and they said what they actually have is like a whitelist for every individual fractal island, so they can manually tweak to make sure that a really gross instability won't randomly assign itself to a fractal where it's really horrible. So you won't get the fractal that causes people to explode and knock you back in fractals where that would be extremely infuriating. And they played through, they tested it, and so this system is now in, and as they add entirely new fractals, which we know they do throughout ongoing development, they'll also get the benefit of randomized fractals. The way that they talked about on the forums, it really sounds like this was always what they wanted, but the original implementation fell short just because, I don't know, maybe they were time crunched or whatever, or it just hadn't worked out right, uh, and now they finally have the system properly in place. So fractals just got a lot more interesting as a repeatable endgame. I've already preferred for a long time now fractals to a lot of the other that repeatable in gaming guild was and now it's just got that much more varied so should be pretty fun um, don't forget also that you know the dailies and the recommendeds are changing day by day too uh, so there's some other changes as well the fractal vindicators have had some balance so remember this is a new instability that they added quite recently which is the guys that appear to stomp you will now fight well, they've reduced the health of them by a substantial amount, almost a third. Uh, and now when you kill a Vindicator, you rally on the Vindicator. So uh, I think that really makes them much, much, much less threatening of a mechanic. And they even have a Telegraph on there too, so... Fractal devs doing as much as they can to stop this stuff being frustrating. Shadow Observatory, one of the new Fractals, they fixed a bug where it could stall. I've never experienced that despite having played quite a lot of the Observatory, but there it is. Uh, the Twilight Obser the, the Twilight Oasis, sorry, the newest Fractal, they added a checkpoint at the beginning um, because people were struggling towards Duena. They've added a lot of checkpoints to that. They've tried to round it out. There was a Reddit post from a dev actually alluding to this a while ago. Um, and then finally, the Last Laugh instability, which I talked about earlier, the knockback I think this is, they won't go on the Avengers. So you won't go downstate, spawn an Avenger, kill the Avenger, and then get knocked back by it, which is like a real chain wombo combo uh, that would be frustrating to deal with on mass. They've uh, refined that down now. So there you go, that's Fractals. Uh, moving on to Raids, uh, there's been a change to Call of the Mist, or a little bit. So Call of the Mist is this buff, if you remember, that doubles rewards for a certain wing. And recently they talked about having Call of the Mist in the newest wing, but also have it rotate through one of the old ones as well. So that each week when your guys get together and try and do a clear, you can maybe pick different wings based on where Call of the Mist is. Well, they say here that they've updated the marker for it in the Aerodrome. So I guess that should just make it a bit clearer. Where This is what I speculate is. Uh, makes it clearer which wing is actually under the effect. Uh, Hall of Chains, the newest wing. They improved the consistency for collision detection of the orbs at the Doom fight. If you watch my recent videos covering this, and particularly obviously the Doom one, um, you'll know that this is a really good change. Really good. One of the frustrating things about the Doom encounter that I never talked about in my video in the end is that when you're practicing it and you're constantly changing the people you play with, a lot of it is just sending people up to do the orbs and then they don't know how it works because the the collision is kind of fiddly and then they wipe and they die. So all nine players, everyone who's playing Guild Wars 2, everybody participating in Guild Wars 2's combat and knows how to raid, they all have to wipe because a guy didn't quite know the detection. Then you have to let him go up again and he practices and maybe he gets it. But you have all these like wipe runs and then maybe you don't get the kill for the week or you go back again and someone new is doing orbs and now they have to learn. And you're just doing all of these wipes not because of anything that's really 
fun about raids, but just because of this one specific element of kind of a mini game almost. So I love to see this. Improve the consistency of collision detection? Wow, maybe my groups especially now, we can get more consistent uh, practice runs in where the things that are wiping us are the actual mechanics down there from the boss, like the chains below 60% and stuff. Love this. Really, really happy with this. They did some personal story refinements for the expansion and episode one, which I don't really have to go in there. You can see if you like another checkpoint's been added in Daybreak. Uh, there were some item changes. Uh, so they changed the names of some of the recipes for War Beast. You've been seeing me run around on a warrior. Hell, maybe I'll put it in the background for this one. And everybody's asking me, hey, what's that armor? What's that armor? It's War Beast armor. Very few people in Guild Wars have actually gone out of their way to get it. They've just changed the recipes to make it more obvious, I guess, how to get it. And we'll see if some people are inspired to rock the awesome War Beast set as I am. Uh, speaking of items as well, I'll take a moment uh, to point out in the previous patch, episode 1, we did a video like this with the general patch notes and we closed it down and it turned out later there'd been other really dramatic interesting item changes and additions to the game that weren't detailed anywhere. So for example the law book UI we had no idea about until later. There's a chance that this patch will have similar things too and so stay tuned because I'll do a future video on that if we do find something else dramatic like those law books or whatever some new feature uh, is here it's just not announced in the patch notes. We'll have to wait a few hours to see what's manifested. Uh, moving on, SPVP. Those who watch me very closely will know I'm super into SPVP right now. Some good changes, nothing too dramatic. So first of all, you can now do standard friendly models, which means that everyone's Fashion Wars 2, except your own on your client, just goes away. Everyone has standard appearance, standard animations, as dry and boring and competitive as you can possibly get. I might even run it because it will probably reduce a bit of visual noise uh, because I won't be seeing everyone's auras and all that kind of stuff. With features like this in the game, please ArenaNet, give us combat tonics in PvP. I want a PvP as a Kodan. I want a PvP as a Watch Knight. There's no reason we shouldn't when we have these options to call that stuff away, right? Anyway, uh, here's a cooler change. The trebuchet on Battle of Kylo has been changed. Ooh. It is now a ground targeted effect and it displays a warning circle in the area of effect. The camera also provides a better view of the map when in use. Right, so, when I read this patch I was really concerned about this because uh, Treb is something I actually think is quite special and cool on Kylo and the uh, mechanics for using it to be able to actually snipe people on the road back in past metas uh, many years ago where Treb was a really pivotal part of fighting on this map it was really cool, the counter player breaking it, of repairing it in time all that fun stuff, um, the kind of builds that would be uh, good there uh, but it's really fallen out of use lately and that's been upsetting to me So seeing a patch note affecting Treb is great because it might push Kylo back into a much more interesting map So brilliant, but then the actual notes themselves seem to suggest that they've just taken the skill cap out of the mechanic and made it boring There's nothing that actually says here. It's got it, it's stronger or it's it's more efficient uh, an upcoming patch might remove the Magi's amulet and refine a lot of the tankiness down, which could mean that maybe Treb has a little bit more impact. But um, So I was a bit worried about this note. I went in game to check it out. That's the footage you can see in the background. Uh, and on actually playing with this for a minute, I don't actually think this is a bad change. Um, the ground targeting actually means that you feel a lot more liberal with when you twist it. Um, and where you fire it, all the timings, the animations, the amount of time it takes to turn the treb and stuff is all still in place. So balance wise, it's the same. But because you get so much more quality of life using it, it is a bit more accessible now. Also, look at that camera view of checking out Kylo. My god, brilliant visibility across the map. It might even have a little bit of utility for like pre made ish. Uh, I mean, I, I, do, I do think, still think it needs a buff, but in terms of like communication and seeing where everybody's rotating to, because you just get so much visibility here. Um, but so yeah, they have changed it. They've just made it a little bit more worth using. It's a bit like what I was saying with the Doom thing, by the way, in the orbs. It's almost like using Treb is, is not Guild Wars 2. It's not combat. It's not PvP. It's like a mini game that you've got to learn on top of everything else. By making it a simple ground target, you actually sort of tweak a lot of that away. And maybe that's for the best, actually. Maybe that actually works really well. It also feels a bit more like Skyhammer now, now that Skyhammer itself was changed a few patches ago, too. Uh, so there is one other thing as well. There's now a ground target tell when a Treb is firing at you. This worried me as well. Um, so one of the coolest things about Treb when it's actually used for Kylo 
is as players, you'd have the, uh, a perfectly executed Guild Wars 2 philosophy, and that's that you don't play the user interface, you actually look at the environment for tells and you watch for dodges. So back in the day when Treb was used a lot, you would hear the audio from the NPC say incoming, and you would know a Treb shot is coming, and you'd actually use your eyes to look at the Treb shot as it came into your node to get the perfect dodge in time. That was awesome. It wasn't like watching a raid tell on the floor where it's just an expanding orange circle within another orange circle, and you're kind of playing the UI. Um, it was actually using the environment, and I loved that. So I read this patch note about them adding a new ground target for it and I'm scared. I'm scared that it's going to be something like the raid thing. But the devs did it perfectly. All the ground target actually is, is as the thin red ring. This is beautiful and is the only thing I really wanted to see. Why? It keeps visual noise down. It doesn't stack on top of this crazy new scourge red effect that they did in a very handy wavy way uh, in a previous patch. So it doesn't like clutter things up too much. Um, you still have to actually watch the treb for the timing, so you're still looking visually at it, so that you know the red ring itself doesn't give you an indication of the timing. The environment does, but it's actually uh, it does offer a bit of counterplay because now it's extremely clear what the range on the treb is, which was always kind of a bit of a nebulous, oh, am I actually in range of it thing before. So now that there's actually a more clear counterplay in terms of outranging treb, I actually think like it's a stronger mechanic now, and now that it's been pushed into that place where the players have that bit more intelligence about where it strikes maybe it will be opened up in a future patch now to be increased in its capacity to affect team fights and we'll see people playing with it a lot do i think this uh single change is enough probably not but i think it made treb a better mechanic so i'm pretty happy with what they saw and i was worried that i wouldn't be Oh, and by the way, there's totally a bug with the game right now that you can see here in the background. Uh, I discovered very fast, that is, if you are on Treb with your camera fully zoomed out, and then you leave the hot join to go back to open world PvE, your camera will remain locked out at that distance until you hit another loading screen. So you can use this to abuse the Guild Wars 2 camera and get insane, like, zoomed out RTS style camera movements that uh, shouldn't be possible. Uh, so if you guys are interested in that for machinima purposes, curiosity purposes, maybe you want to go to some underground map or something and zoom your camera out this far, now's your opportunity, because it probably will get fixed at some point. But uh, yeah, bringing you hot bug news right here. Next in the PvP section, they say that there is now an arena rule set version of Courtyard in custom arenas. I actually have no idea what that means. Maybe you guys can help me in the comments. Does it mean we can revert Courtyard to going back to the old version of the map where the or the Death Orb thing wasn't in it? I don't know. I'm not familiar with Courtyard. Moving on, we got World vs. Worlds. They added those Concentration and Expertise infusions, which were recently added to Fractals, to World vs. Worlds, and uh, there are now vendors in the Obsidian spa uh, Sanctum spawn areas, so that's nice. They have a ton of Black Lion stuff. You guys know me. I'm not too interested in that. Don't forget, though, that mounts uh, are in the game now. There's always mount skins coming in, so there's branded varieties of all of those. Uh, you don't need me to regurgitate this information. You guys who are into the gem store can obviously check a lot of that stuff out. Uh, maybe I'll buy some keys and do something. I guess we'll see. The one really big notable thing uh, a lot of you guys will probably be interested in is new char customization options. That's new horns, new faces, there's new eye colors. I think, I might be wrong, but I think some of it's in the exclusive makeover kits, but I think some has just been added to character creation, unless I'm misreading things on Reddit right now. So that's very cool. More char stuff. You'll remember that there was some char hints from earlier. The legendaries, the claw of the Kana. I'm guessing there'll be some char influence in this story, and there's more customization for them. Uh, and I know those char players will be very happy about that. And that's about it for the listed general changes. Again, it has nothing to do with the actual content, all the new sweet rewards and fun things that could be in there. And I will have uh, quick coverage for all of that for you guys very soon. For now, though, I want to actually get in and play a bug in the system, which, again, had that badass trailer. So if you guys want more information about this, stay tuned. You can check out my video on the trailer from earlier in the week. And um, hopefully you'll have some cool comments down below that we can have uh, a chat about and you can fill us in if we're missing anything major. Thanks everybody, hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you very shortly.